All right, good morning, everyone, and thank you to, for attending um, Social Emotional Behavioral Tier 2. Uh, we are on our second uh, session. Our first session was held about a month ago. Once you access the Padlet and look under Session Materials, there is a post entitled Padlet Session 1, Identification and Intervention Matching that contains the Padlet from the first session that Sarah provided for us, as well as the link to the recording. So if you missed that first session, you will have the opportunity to see the full recording as well as access materials. And speaking of the Padlet, we do have a Padlet um, that where Sarah shared her PowerPoint notes for today, as well as additional resources. We will also be adding resources to the Padlet throughout the morning as Sarah as, is presenting. So keep going back to that Padlet. We will be updating it. Um, and I am uh, Dr. Shonda Talene. I am the co-statewide lead for the Learning Environment and Engagement Initiative. I am joined here with uh, several of my patent colleagues who will be assisting in the chat. They will be updating the Padlet and will be assisting with the Q&A. Um, like I said, we do also have two ASL interpreters present. Um, I am happy to welcome Sarah McDaniel back to PA virtually, mm -hmm. joining us from Alabama. Sarah has been sharing her expertise in the area of Tier 2 intervention for several years, but we wanted to take this opportunity to offer these sessions to everyone. So Sarah, welcome and take it away. All right, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Um, I have a friend that lives up in Pennsylvania and it sounds like you all are still getting some snow intermittently depending on where you live. So um, pointing positive here, I think we're almost to March. So I feel like maybe spring is around the corner for you all. Um, thank you for being here this morning and thank you for taking the time out to um, have some time to yourself to learn about tier two. Uh, if your school is like everywhere that we're looking at across the country right now, uh, we have a lot of students who could use some targeted supplemental support around social emotional behavioral needs. So um, again, the, the point of the framework is really to provide you a step-by-step -step process and as easy as and as simple as we can possibly make tier two for you in these three areas. Remember, so it's social, emotional, and behavioral. Um, just as a little history in PBIS, we used to always talk about behavior. And then as we've evolved, we really are seeing the importance of all three of those components. Um, so we want to make sure that tier two addresses all three as well. So I'm going to back up a little bit just to kind of freshen everybody's brains while the coffee is getting into your nervous system this morning and kind of remind you what we had talked about with tier two last time. Um, last time we talked about everything you would need to set up your initial tier two system. And then for today, after we get through the review, we're going to focus on what happens after you start tier two, kind of those monthly meetings, your annual reviewing your fidelity, different um, forms you might need, agendas for meetings, all those sorts of things. So we're going to kind of, we've chunked it into two parts, which is like, how do you set up your system? And then what does it look like once it gets going? Uh, normally we would have two full days of training. So I do want to let you know that everything in the middle, which is really kind of in-depth procedural training on all of the different interventions, I think there's 10 or 12, um, that takes us a full day. So because these are two briefer sessions, I'm going to overview and just kind of give you a peek at what those interventions look like today. And you have some examples in the Padlet. So follow along for, with the Padlet for sure um, as we're going along. And just also know that some of those interventions uh, usually would take a lot more training if you don't feel completely comfortable going and doing them right away. Um, I do want to say, though, one good thing about Tier 2 and the, the system that we've set up is that you shouldn't have to go purchase anything. So it's not like the interventions that you would need are, you know, are we're not hiding them from you. They're not like at some store or on some website where you would have to go buy a bunch of stuff. So they should be simple, efficient interventions. And those are the ones I'm going to preview. Just also know, though, that we haven't had a lot of time together to go through all of those. So 
let's get started. So we are, remember, talking about using tier two also as a preventative tier. We're hoping to kind of counteract that weight to fail, which really causes a lot of office discipline referrals, exclusionary discipline. And all of what we're doing in PBIS should be proactive and preventative, assuming and thinking through that students are going to need some targeted support, which is a proactive thing to do. It's just to plan for that need being there. Um, before you get going on tier two, you should always have tier one in place with fidelity. Last time we talked about the tiered fidelity inventory, the TFI is our PBIS fidelity tool. It has all three tiers. And for tier one, we're really looking at 70 to 80% as counting um, with fidelity before we can move on to tier two. And we talked about the reason why that is important is because if you don't have tier one in place yet, you are probably going to over identify students for tier two who really just needed that tier one support. We have schools sometimes that say, well, we got to get going right now. We need this right now. Can we just do the two at, at one time? And we're not one to tell you no. You could give it a try. But um, having that really solid foundation of tier one also gets the building used to things like using data in this area. You guys are probably really good at using academic data. So it's, it's a bit of a different skill using social emotional behavioral data, discipline data, the teaming and the um, different meetings that you would have to have. So a lot of what happens in tier one kind of norms things that you would need to have at tier two anyway. So that's the suggestion. Uh, depending on where you are in your process, you could take it or leave it and just know if you're doing the two at one time or if you're starting tier two without tier one fully in place yet, just be on the lookout for over identifying for tier two. And then what we have on the screen are our old percentages and I'll explain why I have to kind of put that little asterisk there now. So typically tier one would serve about 80% of students in your building. Um, so that's why it should catch most of the students um, with that really good structure of your school-wide expectations, your recognition system, a consistent and fair um, consequence system, those sorts of things. So that's 80% of your building. Then our old numbers were about 10 to 15% of your students, even with really good tier one in place, will still need um, tier two supports around social emotional behavioral needs. Then what that leaves us is about one to 5% for tier three, which are our intensive individualized interventions. Those are so intensive. We really don't want too many students falling into tier three. And um, those are your FBAs, your behavior intervention plans. So we really wanna catch as many students as we can at tier two. And the reason why I say these are kind of our old percentages is that these were pre-COVID percentages. We haven't gotten back down to these percentages really from what we're seeing yet. We hope to in the very near future, but as we're all recovering and kind of processing the collective trauma and individual trauma and learning loss and all these things that happened with students, but also their families and educators, we're, we were seeing somewhere around 30 to 40% of students needing tier two as we came back from COVID. And we're now seeing somewhere around 25%. So one in four students needing some tier two support. Now that's gonna vary. Remember when we talked about our screener, you'll see students who have just a very minor need that would look like they need tier two. And then you'll have some students that look like they have a more serious need within tier two. So you can decide at your school how you would deal with that. But again, what we're hoping to get back to eventually is around 10 to 15% at tier two. The reason why that is important is because tier two doesn't come with extra people or resources really. Um, we have reading specialists and math specialists um, in our buildings, at least in Alabama, we don't have any behavior specialists. So if you're lucky enough to have behavior specialists in your building or um, mental health workers or whoever could help with tier two, that is a great resource. We do have to design tier two around whatever's already existing in your building because these are students 
without IEPs and we're not at that level of need yet. So that would be more tier three intensive individualized intervention. So we have to leverage what we have in the building. And so we're hoping to get that back down um, in each building around 10 to 15%. I will also say that even before the pandemic, our schools that are in communities that are of higher need, um, such as communities with high rates of gun violence and um, issues in the community, poverty, and um, a lot of transient families, well, we were always seeing a little bit higher on those percentages. And so in those buildings, we think through, you know, this is, we just have a lot of students who could benefit from some extra support. So sometimes in those buildings, we would push tier two to everyone in the building. So social skills lessons, a mentoring program that touches every kid in the building. Um, every kid has time in the morning for goal setting, those sorts of things. So um, this is all flexible enough to kind of do this in a way that makes sense for your school building. And we've actually had some really good luck with um, schools that showed a lot of need in these areas and that were able to push the simplest tier two interventions um, school-wide. All right. So in tier two, so we're kind of drilling down to tier two now. Remember, we talked about avoiding that one size fits all mentality. I met with 41 schools last week. And um, I said, okay, what tier two interventions do you have? And a few things came up that where I thought I would share with you today, because it was not a Pennsylvania district that I was speaking to, but important enough to kind of show you what the tendency is if we're not really intentional about avoiding this one size fits all mentality. So I had lots of schools tell me that their tier two intervention, the one they have is check in, check out. Remember check in, check out is not a bad intervention. We just have to make sure that we're providing interventions that match and are tailored to the specific tier two need. A few other things that stuck out to me that I thought I would go ahead and mention to you. I had schools telling me that their tier two intervention was screening or something related to data. So just in case that's on anybody else's mind, that's data collection, progress monitoring, screening. Those are procedures, those aren't interventions. I also had um, a lot of schools share with me that tier two intervention was what they're calling tab out and um, calm down areas. Those are not interventions, neither is office discipline referrals or suspension or alternative school. So those are exclusionary discipline procedures. So tab out, I'm not sure if that's a phrase that you all use there, but it's when educators um, have a student who is not being successful in the classroom and they send them to a neighboring classroom across the hall or, or um, down to the front office to talk to somebody. So removing them from the classroom is not an intervention, right? So that's a reactive, punitive response. An intervention would be something that keeps the student in the classroom, or if they do earn an office referral, it pairs with that office referral to help provide the student with an instructional therapeutic strategy or intervention to come back with some new skills. Um, rather than just removing them. So just remember, removing a student doesn't teach them anything new, so that's not an intervention. A few other things that I saw with that group was a lot of them listed things that we should be doing for all students, just kind of differentiated strategies like providing increased praise, changing their seat, um, using proximity, so walking around more, uh, pre-corrections. So all of those things are tier one strategies, good classroom management strategies. So those also wouldn't be listed as tier two interventions. To be a tier two intervention, it has to be designed to be a target. And so for a specific group of students, intervention that's usually short term, shouldn't last too long and pretty easy to do. But it's not just a strategy that we could apply to any student at any time. So avoiding that one size fits all, also avoiding using punishment as an intervention or tier one strategies as, as an intervention, right? Sometimes we also hear that social skills instruction or as we are calling it now, SEL is what we're doing for everyone at tier two 
or some people have a lot of self-regulation strategies. So we have to, those are all fine. Those three are fine um, interventions. And we talk about them as evidence-based interventions, but we have to match them and use them efficiently and make sure we have more than one in place. So the steps that we talked about last time, we spent a good amount of time on readiness and I'm so glad we have the um, recording from last time. So if you missed it, so let's just say your team partner came last time and you're here today and you might be completely lost. You can go back and watch that one. We spent a good amount of time on readiness. We talked about your tier two team. We talked about how that needs to be different from your tier one team and what the purpose of the tier two team is. Remember, we also talked about if you have already an existing academic team that is looking at math, reading, targeted intervention. I don't know if you guys call it RTI, but any tier two for academics, you can pair this team with that team. And the reason we talked about that being a really good idea is because a lot of our students have needs in both areas or these co-occurring needs are actually, one is resulting from the other. So it would make more sense to meet in one meeting um, rather than two separate teams, right? We talked about communication with the student, with other educators in your building and with the family. And then we started going through these steps. So we got through steps one, two, and three. The first step was um, administering your screener. It is February. And so if you haven't done a screener, it's not too late. Um, we would typically though, just so you know, we would be doing the screener in a, around September, um, six or eight weeks or so into the school year. But if you have not done one at all, um, you can do one at any point really towards the end of the year makes less sense, but we'll talk about that really quick in a minute. Then from the screener, we're going to identify students with some targeted needs by those numbers. So using database decisions, and then we're gonna look further at those um, screener numbers to see which category of interventions that student may benefit from. So we talked about conduct, hyperactivity and attention, emotional symptoms, peer problems, and pro-social being the strength. So from the total score, we go to the subscale scores to figure out which one the student really needs to focus on. And from there, we went to our matrix where, and I'll show you another one this morning, where we were able to match the intervention that would fit that student's need based on that category, but then also the level of intensity of the need. We talked about making some adaptations on the front end to those interventions so that they would be a fit for your local context, but also kind of match your students' preferences and interests, such as leveraging technology. Um, if it's something with a mentor like check in, check out, maybe using um, maybe a male student really responds well to uh, female adults. So matching that mentor in a way that makes sense for that student. So those are the initial adaptations. And then we were gonna make this plan for the student where we say, okay, here's what, here's the goal. Here's what we're trying to work on. Here's the intervention we're going to use. Here's what we hope to see. And then from there, you're gonna establish these decision rules about what progress looks like, what you're hoping to see for progress, what you're going to do if you do see progress and then also if you don't see progress. So all of that was in steps one through three. And then what we'll talk about for today is really the ongoing piece. So that sets up, if you're thinking about a timeline, you would be doing your screening around September or end of September, maybe early October. So then you would, the first meeting that that team is having then is really going through all the students who are identified for tier two and creating their tier two plan, establishing which intervention matches their need, who's going to do that intervention, and then their uh, initial adaptations and decision rules. So then hopefully intervention can start in October and by November, December, January, February, March, April, you're having monthly meetings that look like step four. So those monthly meetings then are reviewing progress. So you need some data, we'll talk about that. And really what you're doing is looking for students who are responding the way you would have wanted. And then you're going to spend the most time on students who are not responding well. So what can we do? Do we need to intensify? Do we need to adapt? Do we need to move on to tier three referral? 
And then also the students who are doing great, we need to plan for fading intervention. So those monthly meetings become like that. You probably will have a few throughout the year, um, new students who are referred to tier two. So each monthly meeting, you may have one or two students who have been newly referred to tier two because of some changes in circumstances for them. But most of those meetings are gonna be about progress monitoring and modifying based on responsiveness. Okay, so remember we talked about identification. I don't know if any of you went back and explored different screeners or kind of thought through screener you might be already using and how you could leverage this additional screener, but I hope that we're all in agreement that we're not just gonna use discipline data. We talked about why last time. We do need nomination procedures, but rather than just using a teacher nomination, we want the teacher to nominate by completing a screener. So it's okay for teachers to nominate. We want them to be able to let us know if they think a student needs extra support, but we will need the screener data for that student. So we landed on the strengths and difficulties questionnaire as our systematic screener. And again, if you missed it last time, um, you can go back and watch that. I think probably all those materials are in that Padlet. So um, you would find that there. If you weren't with us last time or if you need a reminder, do not print this out. The SDQ is free. Um, you can find it on their website, but don't print this out, remember, because you would have to go back and score it by hand. Some of these are reverse scored, and then also the items are not appearing together for the different subscales. You would have to go pull out individual items. So I shared with you an Excel spreadsheet that you would fill it out electronically and it will score it for you on the third tab at the bottom of the Excel spreadsheet. But these are the 25 questions. Each question is scored as not true, somewhat true, or certainly true. And from there you get a total score. And then from the total scores, how you determine who is in need of tier two, and then after you get your list of students who need tier two, the team can look through the subscale scores for those students. Okay, and again, I don't know the SDQ. Um, there is uh, SDQ info is I think where you can find the uh, different translations in different languages um, of the form and you can actually find this PDF there. One thing is, if you'll remember, you see the T at the top. So this is the teacher completed one. That was the only one that we needed. If you want to add the student completed and or the family completed, they do have a P for parent and a C for child version of the SDQ. Those are not required to get going with tier two. If you're looking at a more efficient, simple uh, framework, just use the teacher. Um, but if you are curious or your school really values student voice, you could have the students also fill this out. Um, the scoring at the bottom is their system where you would electronically fill it in in their system. It, there is a charge, though, for that. I, I don't know how much. It used to be a dollar per student or something. Um, so it would actually score and then store those scores. But you can leverage the Excel spreadsheet that I um, sent you to because one of the reasons why we landed with the SDQ is because it is free and easily available. So that was our screener. Again, normally we would be doing this in September or so. So 25 items for all students in the building. One teacher would complete this and then the team would look at the students who met the cutoff score. And those would be our students for tier two. And then we start matching intervention from there. If you need the cutoff scores, that was in the last um, section. Also, you can probably find that information in the SDQ info. Just make sure you're looking at the cutoff scores for the teacher completed version. Okay, so that was step one, administering the screener. Then we can identify students with specific needs. These are the categories on the SDQ. So the categories match on to a group of interventions that fit with that need. So we're actually using interventions that are tailored to that specific need. So for emotional symptoms, different cognitive behavioral treatments, therapies, um, you don't even have to use CBT. If you have something small group, 
um, or individual or uh, weekly sessions on um, calming strategies, self-regulatory strategies, journaling. The emotional symptom category, remember, is what we were referring to the school counselor for. So your school counselors are trained in all of the different treatments that we can use at school for um, any emotional symptoms. So this is just one example, but again, that one would go, students referred for emotional symptoms would go to the counselor. Everyone else, we can provide intervention in the classroom or without the school counselor, obviously the school counselor is on the team. So our conduct problems were those kind of um, big aggressive verbal aggression, physical aggression, and then also the deviant behaviors we talked about. So lying, stealing, cheating. And those match on to check in, check out variations. I'll show you those quickly. We also talked about more classroom related, academic related behaviors, um, such as off task, lack of engagement, um, homework completion, assignment completion, talking in class, those sorts of things. So lower on intensity, nobody's unsafe, let's say, but much more frequent and also usually getting in the way of academic instruction. So the learning of that student and the learning of others. So that whole category matches on to self-regulation strategies where we want to try to shift the regulation from the teacher trying to regulate the student saying, get back in your seat, you didn't raise your hand, those sorts of things to where we're actually supporting the student and being able to uh, regulate their own kind of academic related behaviors in that area. The next two, remember we fold down into one category of need. The pro-social behavior at the bottom, our orange, that is supposed to be an area of strength. So the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, this is the area of strength that we were trying to identify. And when we can identify an area of strength, we can really leverage that strength to help plan behavior, um, any sort of intervention around that strength. So let's say the strength is, um, gets along really well with younger children. So you can have, you can set up that, if we meet this goal, or if you meet your behavior contract, you can go read a book to your favorite first grade class or something like that. So knowing an area of strength really helps us plan intervention. If you cannot find a strength in this score, so if that score is actually really low, it means that we have some need in all sorts of um, social skills. So whether that's with same age peers, younger children or adults. So that would really just map, map on to what we were already doing with social problem solving in the pink area, which would be students who specifically have social problem solving needs for peers, so same age peers. And then the orange, if you don't have a good score on that strength area, it would really mean that we need to support the student across social problem solving with younger children, same age peers, and um, adults as well. Okay, so that got us to our matrix last time. We talked a little bit about adapting and how just different ideas of how you would get to know the student well enough to be able to make adaptations that they would need. But we're gonna focus on the matrix for a minute and then we're going to, um, I want you to find your blank matrix in your Padlet. And I'm going to preview what these interventions look like. We didn't get a chance to do that last time because we ran out of time. But again, just reminding you that we don't have enough time to do all the training for all these different interventions today. And really importantly, this teal green color, remember, is for our school counselor. So um, they will have training on all of the different interventions and strategies in that area. So hopefully the matrix looks familiar to you now. So we have our hyperactivity and attention. Right here, then we have our peer problems. And if you look at pro-social, those two sets of interventions match. We have our teal green color, blue color for our school counselors here in the middle. And then we have our conduct problems and that was the aggressive and defiant deviant behaviors with check and check out variations. So the numbers that you see below are the cut points from the SDQ for borderline and then what they call abnormal, you could call it um, anything you want. You don't have to use their terminology. We use different terminology when we present um, to schools based on what they wanna use. So kind of like elevated or um, 
high need, whatever kind of words you want to use. But what is important is that these cut scores are different every category you look at. So you can't, it's not just one cut score, you know, a six for everything is um, borderline or elevated. Um, you have to look category by category to see those different scores and where the student fits in. So when you're matching, the first thing you do is you match to a category. So you find your category that has the score that you've identified as the one that you want to focus on. Then within that category, you can kind of go up and down like an accordion in this category to determine, do you want to start with the simplest intervention? Those are the ones at the top. Or do you want to start with something a little bit more intensive and then back off from there? So for each category, you see three different interventions. And some of these are just variations of the same intervention, not really different interventions. But what we've done is we've organized them from less intensive to most intensive at the bottom. So you could, as a team, decide what makes the most sense for you. You could decide that all tier two um, interventions will start at the most simple borderline level. And then you'll go from there just because of efficiency or resources. Or you could decide for certain students, we might start in that higher range and then fade back. You still have one more below that before you get to tier three, which would be down here. So if we don't respond to all these interventions in the category, there's still tier three. Remember that we talked about about one to five percent of your students will still need tier three. Okay, so there's a few questions in the q and I don't know if anybody on the team wants to, those have sat there for a minute. So if anybody wants to jump off mute and let me know what those are, or is there anything that we need to address? Rachel, are we good with the q and I, I think we're good. There were some questions yes. about materials. So um, the Padlet that you have a link to has a link to the day one Padlet within it. So if you look under session materials, underneath presentation slides, it says Padlet session one. That will give you the access to the slides, the resources, the information about the SDQ, as well as the recording from day one. It's all within the Padlet link that we're sending you today. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. Okay, so with that, we will start to talk about just preview these interventions really quick. I, again, we don't have time for training. Um, what we're talking about on hyperactivity and attention. So those are those kind of off task behaviors during academic instruction. Mostly we would start with goal setting and the goal would be around that behavior. So let's just say it's out of seat behavior. So you would set a goal, work with a student on the goal setting sheet. I'll show you some examples. Um, that goal could be a daily goal. It could be a weekly goal. So that is very flexible for you to be able to adapt to what that student needs. The next thing that we would do, so we're not adding these together. That's an important thing to point out. Sometimes folks think that we're like actually adding and layering all these interventions. If goal setting does not work, we would be shifting to the intervention of self-monitoring, which only would happen during one academic period a day. Usually if we're working on out of seat, that would be when we're out of seat the most. And self-monitoring is a different intervention. What we're actually going to do is teach the student how to monitor their own in-seat behavior. Sometimes the teacher will also need to monitor alongside that student. But what we're hoping to do is during that one period of day, set up a system that they are prompted to regulate and monitor whether they're in their seat or out of their seat. And then there's the conversation with the teacher afterwards and contingent reinforcement. And then what we would do if we still need a little bit more intensive is to um, train and teach that student how to graph their own data and look at their own out of seat behavior over time. So that's really adding self graphing to self monitoring. So we'll look at some of those examples. Um, most everybody has heard of behavior contracts. So whether that's in the purple column for peers specifically or in the orange column for younger children, same age children, older children, adults, uh, behavior contracts should be kind of tailored to that social problem solving area of needs. So whether that's 
um, disagreeing, communicating effectively, sportsmanship on the playground, whatever area of need, that's what the behavior contract would focus on. Um, so we would start with that. You could have a behavior contract that is lasting a week. You could have a behavior contract that is every two days. So that's really flexible as well. It's really just a sheet of paper, like the goal setting, um, but focused on that social, pro social problem solving area. Then what we have in this kind of higher range is our problem solving activities. So there's a variety of those. A lot of states and districts are using um, restorative practices. So if you have a restorative circle that you can do, that when a social conflict happens, whether it's with a student and an adult or two students, you have a process for um, processing that event that occurred and repairing that event that would fit right there under problem solving activities. Those are usually reactive. So a problem has occurred and it's all about how we process that problem. Uh, without an intervention in that area, what we typically see is um, maybe a fight occurs and the students are removed from the school, sent home for three days, and then they come back and they haven't repaired their relationship. They haven't repaired whatever happened um, with people watching and maybe adults that had to be involved and they're just back at school three days later or four days later. Um, so this is this area is really about processing that event. So individually with the student, what was going on in the context before that happened that day? Uh, why would we choose the behavior that we chose? What can we do better next time? And then repairing the relationship with the other person. So uh, making an apology, discussing that, all that sort of thing. So that would be our problem solving activities. Pick whichever one you might already have in your building um, and put that one there. There are some other examples too, if you don't have one. And then social skills instruction, that small group social skills instruction fits at the very bottom where you would actually be pulling students out of um, any time in class, making a small group for um, anything such as um, following directions, simple things like that, communication, um, friendship groups, uh, what happens when you disagree, what happens when there, there's conflict. So those are usually topical around the skill that that student is having a problem with. So again, we wouldn't be going through the 92 lessons that are in your social skills curriculum. It would really be tailored and targeted in that small group. All of those students are needing some support with that same or similar um, skill. Okay, and that one is flexible too. So you could have one social skill lesson per week for 20 minutes, you could have a 60 minute lesson, you could have two lessons per week. So that one's really flexible too. You could go for a small group that only meets for four weeks, or you could do a small group that meets all year long if you want. So that one's really flexible. The emotional symptom category is for our school counselors. They might start out with something in that borderline or barely elevated range of something like um, feelings charts, journaling coping strategies, calming strategies, those sorts of things, actual strategies. Again, this is not where we just remove the student, but this is where we're actually teaching students how to um, take deep breaths, how to recenter themselves when they're, um, notice when they're feeling angry and come back to their body and kind of take a moment before they respond. So those sorts of strategies could be the easiest. And then there are all sorts of other things that our school counselors know how to do, including when we're in a crisis, referring out for additional mental health support. Um, so not ignoring that. And then in that kind of higher elevated range, we might use something like individual or small group, maybe even longer term curriculum um, using some sort of treatment like PAS or um, one that we use here, which is called coping power. So that again, though, is up to the school counselor. And then conduct problems are our check-in, check-out variations. A lot of you have already heard of check-in, check-out. That simple check-in, check-out, it's not simple. There actually is uh, a lot to it, but that first version, the initial version is what we would start with, with the kind of barely elevated score. And then we would intensify to check-in, check-up, check-out. So you have a midday check-up. And then if you have a behavior, full-time behavior interventionist, behavior specialist, they could do this last intervention here listed is check, connect, and expect. So that one does take a full-time person who all they're doing is serving students 
um, at tier two with these sorts of needs. Um, and if you want to look that one up, it's check, connect, and expect. Okay, so our, our orange column here is our last column, and that really just matches everything we just talked about in the purple column. So you're down to four different columns with three interventions in each um, column based on intensity. Okay, so we talked about at your school or in your district, things that you will have to plan for. These really come from the tiered fidelity inventory. So it's not just Sarah trying to make your life more complicated or make things more difficult for you. So we talked about teaming. We talked about that screening process and really having clear um, guidance on that. Your different tier two interventions, database decision-making, not guessing, and then any other procedures such as checking fidelity, communication out with families and those sorts of things. All right, so with that, that is our first little review from last time. So if you're completely lost, what I would suggest is hang in there with us for now. And um, when you have a chance, go back to day one and all of that should make a lot more sense. So if we can all go to the Padlet, what I'm going to pull up next is a blank matrix. And I'm going to tell you why we're going to start there. Let's see if my, my computer is loading. Give me one second. Let's see, so if you can go to your Padlet. Okay, you should see something like this. So this is really where we would want you to start. So you could take, just copy paste the matrix that I just went over for you, but it may not fit your context. So we talked last time about schools that are using um, different screeners. So if your screener is telling you internalizing versus externalizing, and you're going to stick to that screener, you would adapt this and take off the last three columns. And then you would plan for what interventions you have available for internalizing and what interventions you have available for externalizing. The SDQ is the one with the five different domains. There is the um, there, there's, there's other intervention categories that different screeners will give you. So there's one that it says academic, but it's not the Sabres has an academic category. It's more like academic behaviors, but this is all adjustable. So if you wanted six domains, if you wanted to have two domains, because that fits the five fits the SDQ. And then the reason why we really want to give you the blank matrix is because you may already have things in your school that fit within that category. So what we talked about last time is making sure, first of all, checking off that they're evidence-based interventions. So we're not just grabbing something from Pinterest or teachers pay teachers, right? So we're actually, we have research to support that intervention. And then we have to look at the participants that that research was done with and make sure that the description of the participants matches that category. So all of the participants had issues with um, staying on task or all of the participants had issues with um, depressive symptoms or all the students had um, incidents of physical aggression. So that's how you would know that it fits that category of intervention. So if you already had something, so last week we talked about a school that already had a peer mentoring program. And they said, well, where would we put that? And we said, well, tell us a little bit more about it. The peer mentoring sounds like a great thing. Any peer mediated intervention, especially at secondary is great. So what do they focus on in mentoring? If it's just academic, if it's just tutoring, that's not gonna fit on this matrix. That's gonna be for your academic kind of tier two. But if they talk about um, different social conflicts that they're having. Maybe they're talking about bullying. Maybe they're talking about how to make friends. That would go under peer problems or pro-social. So if you have something that's already in your district or in your school that is evidence-based and designed to be targeted for tier two, you can fit that into the matrix in a way that makes more, most sense for you. What I don't want you to do is end up with only two domains and only one intervention in each domain. That's not going to give you enough flexibility to serve 
students diverse needs at tier two. If you only have one intervention under each category, you're going to move really quickly to tier three because you're not going to have anything else to try. So you do want to build in three options, if possible, two at a minimum under each category that you have. Okay, so the blank matrix is really to make sure that you understand the structure and then you can kind of fit this to the, the structure and the resources that you have at your school or in your district. Okay, so keep a hold of that blank matrix. And then um, I'm going to preview for you just a little bit about the different interventions and where they fit on the matrix that we already talked about this morning. Okay, so go back to your Padlet. Try not to lose everything as I talk to you here. Let me pull up our matrix really quick. We're going to look at that and then I'll walk you through which ones we're looking at. Okay, so we will start out with, let's start out with the hyperactivity inattention category. So we're going to start out right here. So you'll see that we're going to start with goal setting and then we're going to move to self-monitoring and then self-monitoring with self-graphing. So go back to your Padlet and let's explore those different interventions there. You should have, let's see, let's start with goal setting activity. So in your Padlet, we gave you something called goal setting activity. Let's see if everybody can find that. I'll show you what it looks like. You see this? So for goal setting, it's literally just a sheet of paper. And this is a Word document. You can put your school's logo at the top. You can modify this in any way that works for your school. You could even put this on a Google form and send it to the student electronically as long as the student is having some interaction with the person they're setting goals with. So all the goal setting is, so again, we're under a hyperactivity and attention. Name, my goal for today is stay in my seat. Keep my bottom in my seat. The goal is important to me because I can learn better when I'm in my seat. It's more respectful to my peers and my teacher when I'm in my seat. So they're filling this out. One thing that's really important under this category and for most of them is that they, these answers are coming from the student. They're not coming from the adult. We're not doing tier two interventions to students. We're working together and kind of co-creating these. And the creation of the goal is part of the intervention, really talking through what do we need to focus on one thing at a time and the rationale for why that's important. And then the student actually lists out what are the things that are going to help me stay in my seat today. So I will reach this goal by putting a picture reminder on my desk, remembering that I have this goal, um, when I get out of my seat, remembering to go back to my seat, whatever the steps are. And then they list out what are the good things that will happen when I meet the goal. And the goal check could happen later that day. It could happen at the end of the week. So this is really just a very simple piece of paper intervention that you can modify to meet your needs however you would like. And again, we, have, we actually have these in Google Forms when we had to go to um, COVID and online learning, we kind of shifted everything to be electronic. And so what the teachers would do would send is send the student the form to fill out in the morning and they would fill out their goal and then they would kind of rate themselves at the end of the day. So that's, that's goal setting. It's, um, there's lots of examples out there too, if you want more examples than that. Okay, let's look at the next one. Uh-oh, don't close all tabs. Hold on guys. Okay, let's look at the next one in order, which was self-monitoring. So I am pulling up one that we are called, we call BP self-monitoring. This is from a research study that we did. So let me show you that one. Okay, go to your Padlet and see if you can find this one here. Give a little bit of wait time with that. So this was the next one down. We started with goal setting, then we moved to self-monitoring. 
So this is actually four days. You would cut this piece of paper into quarters here. And this little tiny card is what would go on the student's desk for self-monitoring. So the skill that the student is working on is staying on task or in the student's language, am I working? So every three minutes, the teacher will prompt the student, maybe a tap on the shoulder or a little alarm goes off. And the student answers the question right now, am I working, yes or no? So if they're out of seat, if they're turned around, if they're daydreaming, if they're talking to somebody else, that's going to be a no. So the teacher describes exactly um, objectively what does it mean to be able to say yes and what is a no. For this one, we had a student who wasn't rating themselves accurately, which happens a lot in the beginning. Um, and so the teacher was also filling out the same, at the same time, the teacher's observation of the student. Were they working? Were they on task at that moment or not? And so in the beginning, the teacher, the student might have said, yes, 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 yes. And that wasn't a very accurate reflection of what they were actually doing. Um, and so the teachers came behind and said, okay, we'll match it up. So then they started talking about accuracy. And I had a no, but you had a yes. Let's talk about that. So um, it, when you fade off of this, you can actually first fade the teacher's um, second evaluation and just let the students do this. So then they would add up their total. So that's a really simple self-monitoring sheet there. Again, just a piece of paper and a little bit of time. So that was our first example. You should have that one. I'm looking for our next example. Here is one. So if you look at elementary SM, that's self-monitoring. Show you that one. It's a little bit fuzzy. It was a cute one that somebody created. So an elementary version, my self-monitoring form. Again, as much as we can get the student to do all of these things on their own, that's what's going to change the and improve the behavior in this area. So if it requires the teacher to stay on the student, remind the student, correct the student, add the totals up, all those things, it's not the intervention that you're, it's not a self-regulation intervention. What you need is to shift the responsibility for understanding what behavior is supposed to look like, understanding and evaluating whether or not they're doing that expected behavior, and then also kind of if they're not correcting that all on their own, that's what we're trying to shift to. It's like real independence around this. Um, so this would just be a little checklist. It actually has the student signing, the teacher signs. Um, so any of these different self-monitoring forms, we it could be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet and they're recording every 30 seconds, every minute, every three minutes, um, things like on task, um, raising hand, uh, staying in your seat, completing work, those sorts of things. So this is just another example. I think you have one more in your Padlet, but I'm not gonna go over that one now. This brings up an important topic and it's for me to reinforce, I think we said it last time, but none of these interventions should be gotchas. They shouldn't be more opportunities for the student to fail. So if that means, let's just say for instance, goal setting, they don't wanna go meet with their person. We're not even going to focus on the actual goal. Our first goal is to meet with the person. Same thing on self-monitoring. So we're not going to focus on how many times they were out of seat, how many times they were in seat. We're just going to focus on great job filling out three out of five of your checklist. Let's see if next time we can try to get to four out of five. So none of this is just another opportunity for a student to fail. You really have to adapt it, get them bought in on the process, and then you can start going. Also, for any student, and this works for grownups too, because we have things like uh, rewards programs and um, awards for who goes to the gym most often, right? But thinking through the contingent reinforcement that's on the other side of participating. So not just the intrinsic part about um, my grades are getting better. I'm getting really great feedback from uh, my teachers. My mom is getting emails home about how great I'm doing in class. That's all intrinsic re reinforcement. You might have to add something short term um, that's more extrinsic. So whatever they respond to, it might be 
being the teacher's helper. It could be uh, reading a book to a younger student. It doesn't have to be like candy or anything like that kind of tangible, but you might want to think through for buy-in kind of what's in it for the student. And if they're not in it for just improving their behavior in the beginning, then you can kind of set up a system. Okay, what would you like to earn? This is really important to both of us. And again, I'll, we were not going to have time to go through all of those different adaptations for all the different interventions, but that point is important. Just to remember, we're not setting up the students um, again to, to fail at something. This is all really, we want them to succeed, even if that means the goal in the beginning is just to meet with us just to fill out the piece of paper, it's okay because we're gonna shift from there or we're gonna slowly increase the goal. All right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, let's see. All right, so we did have the self-graphing example. We have this one in the book and it was so cute because I had my son do the example, fill it in graph and he, filled it in on his best friend bow. It was really cute. So this is, and this is for secondary, you would be using graphing skills in Excel or whatever you're doing with math. Um, so this is an example of taking that same data that you already have from self-monitoring and getting the student to visually represent that for themselves. So we're going to have the data graph for us as adults on our team. This is really helping the student see for themselves where they are over time. And even younger children can do this and understand the trends. We're going up or we're going down. You could draw a goal line across here. Let's say your goal is 60%, which isn't very good, but that might be your starting goal. You could actually put a Sharpie line that's across that's at 60% and the student can see if they were below or above 60%. So this would be just adding one more component. Again, there's nothing kind of complex or difficult or to purchase around this. So we have self-monitoring and then this would be adding that most intensive, which is adding them self-graphing those data and looking at it visually. Okay, so you have that example in your Padlet. And hopefully I'm not going too fast for the Padlet and you guys are able to find these. Okay. I'm going to pull our matrix back up. We're going to peek at that again. All right, so those were the interventions in this pink category here. So the self, the goal setting sheet, the self monitoring app or sheet that we talked about, and then graphing those. If you are using the MobiGo or any of the self monitoring apps, it will graph it for you. So that's really just building in, showing the graph to the student getting them to understand the graph and their progress and their goal line. All right, let's go to the peer problems and pro-social category. So that's the purple <clears throat> or the orange. We're gonna start out with behavior contracts. There are tons of these out there. And um, when we go through training, we really kind of go through what are the most important components on a behavior contract. They can look a lot of different ways. So remember, if we're using it in this category, we're really going to focus the contract on something pro-social that's related to another person. Um, so something about friendship, something about disagreeing or communicating, all of those kind of social similar skills. So this is an example of a contract where the student is showing respect by getting to class on time. It's a little bit of a procedural thing, but could be social related. So it might be that we're spending too much time in the hallway socializing and we actually have to balance a little bit of social time with getting to our class on time. So the contract is pretty much laying out exactly what the student has to do. Like, what is it called? What does it actually look like? So for this teacher, being on time means being inside the classroom and seated at the desk prior to the bell ringing. I know different teachers have different uh, definitions of being on time to class or being tardy. So you would put your definition there. It says here also that the teacher is going to determine if the student is on time, what the student will receive if they're on time. And then the goal here is arriving on time for five consecutive days. 
and then the student can kind of get this bonus. And so they're going to keep track of the on time behaviors here. And there's a little extra bonus clause here. And they're earning extra tickets that's related to the tier one system. And then the student signs and the teacher signs. So the main components of a behavior contract are to specifically outline, and it kind of comes in this language where the student is developing this or we're co-developing this behavior contract with the student. They own this. This is what they're agreeing to. Um, with an adult figuring out the goal is to arrive to class on time each day, then defining exactly what that looks like. And then just like you would in a rental agreement, defining the terms. So who is going to determine whether that uh, behavior was in place or not? What are you going to receive? What's going to happen if you do? How are we going to track that for how much time? And then kind of this um, official signatures at the end really just caps off the the legalese that makes it look like an actual contract. So those are behavior contracts. It's really, again, it's just a sheet of paper and you can adapt those in any way that uh, works for your school. So that was the first one under social problem solving. Again, the purple and the orange. We don't have anything, oh, we do. Let me show you example of the problem solving activity in case you don't have restorative practices at your school. A lot of schools that we're working with right now have that. So they're using that. Let me show you, uh -oh, I lost you guys. Let me shrink this. Okay, here we go. Okay, so that second intervention down, if you don't already have a restorative process for when events happen, um, with social problem solving, so social conflict between peers or a student and an adult, you could add this. So it's, just, again, it's just a sheet of paper. Somebody's going to have to do this with the student, though, process this event. And we call this the antecedent behavior consequence graphic organizer. It's really just visually representing the incident that occurred. So what was happening when I got into trouble? What was the context? What did I, what, you can talk about the behavior that they choose. What did I do because of that? So somebody got in my face. Somebody bumped me in the hallway. I had a bad morning at home. Um, I spilled my tray in the lunch room. Something like that. That's the context. And then what did I do? I kicked the milk and made a mess in the cafeteria. I pushed the student who got in my face. So what did I do because of this? Then the consequence is what we list next. So understanding very explicitly the pattern of this behavior. So this was happening. This is what I chose to do. This is what happened because I did that. So I had to clean up the whole cafeteria. Um, Johnny isn't my friend anymore. I had to sit out during playground time. I got a note home, whatever it was. And then what we really want to focus on is this next one here the section that's about the repair or the plan for next time. So this is the pattern. And if you have a few of these over time, you can show the student like, oh, I remember last time we talked about this. It was also the morning. So whenever we're having a rough morning, we should probably remember that these things tend to happen. So the pattern over and over, teaching them the pattern of their own behavior. But then the really powerful part is, what will I try to do better next time? So let's say somebody does get in your face or you're um, lunch tray does spill. What's a, what's a different choice that we could pick next time instead of the one that happened? So if you don't have restorative practices, this is a one page um, sheet that you can use to process those events. When we do do training, we do emphasize that this is the only intervention that we do reactively. So it requires a problem to have happened. And then it's all about a therapeutic way to process that event that occurred. The rest of all the tier two interventions we work on are proactive and preventative, so they don't require an actual problem to have occurred. So that's the only one that does. There's also in your Padlet for students who are not reading and writing, there's a version of the same that's uh, picture representations, and you can see that one. Okay, and then the last one in that category, let me show you the matrix again. Okay, so we are on purple and on orange. So the we did behavior contracts, 
We did problem solving activities you get to choose or you can use that example. The last one is social skills instruction. Lots of different options for this one. So first of all, you may have curriculum in your building. You might wanna check with your special education friends. We tend to um, have these for our classes or even your school counselor. If you don't have boxes of curriculum, so that would be things like um, second step, paths, incredible years. If you don't have um, too good for violence, if you don't have boxes of curriculum for social skills, it is okay. Because all you are really gonna do for tier two anyway is pick out the units and the lessons within that curriculum that match that student's need. You can go online and find lots of different free social skills lessons for those skills that that group of students need. So we see a lot of times like a middle school girls group and it's all about gossip and um, how do we solve conflicts together? What do we do reporting and tattling when somebody's talking about somebody else? So you would find lessons that are for that group that are specific to that group's need. So you again, you wouldn't be going lesson one through 92 because it's tier two. We're just going to focus on the ones in that area. So there are lots of freely available social skills uh, curriculum out there. They're not as snazzy as those boxes of curriculum. The box will give you the teacher's manual, student workbooks, um, maybe videos to watch, all that. The basic components of a good social skills program, you will find the defined skill. The Whoever's leading the group will define that for the student and explain why it's important. There will be some role play or games or a story about that. And then the students get to practice that in this kind of inauthentic environment in the group. And then what we're hoping is that they go and practice that and get feedback in the natural environment back in class or in PE or wherever they are. So if you don't have curriculum in your building, it may be good to put on a wish list or you can go find lessons that um, meet those needs, those specific targeted needs online too. So if you need help with that, let us know. I also, I don't know if um, Patton has any resources for that where there's, if you guys already know, everybody uses this one curriculum, that's totally fine. Again, social skills instruction goes way at the bottom though, because it's much more intensive. So we're taking a student out of class time or sometime in their day to form a small group. And this is gonna be a weekly thing. So it's, it's the most intensive on there. We wouldn't want to do social skills for everyone because it doesn't match what everybody needs. And we would probably start out with something more simple like a behavior contract if we could. Okay. All right, let's go to, so I think we talked about the emotional symptom category being our school um, counselors. Also, you may have, let's see, social worker, school psychologist, uh, mental health workers, whoever you have in the building, that category is not for teachers necessarily. The teacher may get strategies that a student could use in the classroom, such as reminding the student to use their coping strategy, their calm strategy, their feelings chart or journal. Those might happen in the classroom, but the student is learning those strategies from the counselor or uh, whoever is working with that outside of the classroom. Okay, so the last one we'll look at really quick is the one with lots of C's and I don't, it looks like I didn't even put an example in there. The check in, check out forms, I don't see any of those in there. We might have to take a break and get those or I'll just find one and I'll put it in the Padlet in a minute. So the last category for conduct are the check-in, check-out varieties. And the last one in that is check, connect, and expect. We talked about that one already. It requires a full-time person. The rest of check-in, check-out does not. So anyone can work through check-in, check-out. It does require more resources than the rest of the tier two interventions, which is why it's always interesting to me when people say, everybody's doing check-in, check-out. Because it's actually one of the interventions, even at the most basic level, it requires a good bit. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. Okay. And I'll get this one in the Padlet if the team will help me remember.
I hope I'm not the only one that has to talk to myself when I'm going through all these different tabs. Thank you all for showing me grace. Okay. So check in, check out again is just essentially a piece of paper. There's no big box of curriculum or software program you need to purchase or anything like that. The one piece of paper is a little bit deceiving though because it takes a lot of different components and some time. So I will walk you through this. If everybody can kind of see, this is the piece of paper right here. There's, it's kind of cut off a little bit with signatures, but really it's just this. So every day the student meets with their check-in check-out mentor. That could be called a check-in check-out coach. We try not to use the classroom teacher only because sometimes the issues are in the classroom. There's already kind of a damaged relationship there. It also just helps to have an extra person in the student's life in the building um, who gets to talk to them and praise them and get to know them as well. So if possible, this is where we would leverage front office staff, bus drivers, grandparent volunteers, nutritional staff, librarians, anybody who's available twice a day. So you have a check-in in the morning and you have a check-out with that same person in the afternoon. Throughout the day, the student is carrying this card and I will get to all my secondary friends in just a minute. So we'll go through the elementary, the initial version first. So in elementary, the student is carrying the card, the teacher's trying to keep up with the card for the student, um, but the student has this card all throughout the day. And after each period, whatever you wanna call that. So for younger children, that might be reading, science, PE, math, writing. So it could be like by period for secondary or it could be by subject area, it's totally fine. And throughout the day, the student is getting rated by a teacher. They're getting rated on the school-wide expectations. So you see here, the school-wide expectations are PROWL, P-R-O-W-L. You could individualize this. It's just starting to look more like tier three when we start individualizing the daily card for check-in, check-out. So typically we use the school-wide expectations here. So was the student on time? Did the student show respect? Was the student organized? Did the student, did the student demonstrate a winning attitude? Was the student in class and learning? So this is just one school's examples here. You would put yours there. You might have three, and then you would delete the other lines. Hopefully you don't have any more than five because that's always a lot. So after each period, the teacher discusses with the student so they don't just score them and hand the sheet to them. They explain why they're earning these different scores. So a two is, is, yes, we were definitely on time. A one is, I think we came in at the last minute, maybe we're a few seconds late. A zero is you were out in the hallway and I had to ask you to come into class. So kind of each, each teacher after each period rates on these, so circles a score. And then at the end of the day, the student goes back to their mentor or coach, whatever you want to call them, and they add up their point total for the day. So this one is out of 50 possible. And then they say, they circle, I met my goal or I did not meet my goal today based on those points and the percentage. If the student meets their goal, they get access to whatever they had entered as the incentive. So again, that could just be a phone call home. That could be um, a, a note to your teacher. It could be an actual tangible, if it's a younger child, like, a sticker, that sort of thing. Um, and that is check in, check out. So you have that morning meeting where you get your card, you set your goal, then all throughout the day, there's these ratings on the card. And then at the end of the day, you go back to that same person and add up your scores and talk about whether you met your goal. So for all my secondary friends who are like, oh no, our ninth graders are not carrying this card around. You would be correct. Your ninth graders are not going to carry this card around. So um, you can actually make this digital. You can make it in a Google form. There's also, if you guys are using Swiss already, so school-wide information systems out of Oregon, um, there is a check-in, check-out app now for Swiss that's all online. Um, then there is... Another app, I'm gonna maybe mess it up. I think it's called Be Positive, like a B-E and then a plus sign, I think. Um, so there's another kind of app that would do something similar. 
So yes, for our secondary students, other than technology in some sort of way, which you still have to actually talk to the student, you can't just force it all through technology and the, the teacher and the student aren't discussing because that feedback is actually really important, that interaction. Um, the other, other options that we see at work pretty well is shrinking this card down to like pocket size for our older students, um, which you don't want to do, which uh, we've actually seen happen before, is you don't want to put this on like fluorescent green card stock because we've had teachers before who say, well, we don't want them to lose it. So we're going to put this on a really bright paper. But really all that does is kind of stigmatize the student who has to carry this around. So if you don't have any technology capabilities with this, make it really small or foldable where they can kind of put it in their binder or in their pocket and make it a lot more discreet. And again, if the student doesn't participate, the first thing that all you're working on first is bringing this card back. Then you're working on bringing the card back with, with five out of six periods of the day completed, and then six out of six. And then you can start really looking at those data and the totals and the percentages. So um, not, a, not another gotcha, just remember that. Okay, so that one is check in, check out. You've got your morning check in, your afternoon check out. Um, we've had schools, just as a little FYI, um, skip the midday because they hear check in and check out is all I have to have. I'm going to see the student in the morning. I'm going to see him in the afternoon. And we're getting rid of this whole thing because this is too much. You are now not doing the check in, check out intervention in its evidence based design. So it's no longer check in, check out. I know the title of the intervention is check in, check out, but you actually have to have this middle section too. Okay. So that was. Check in, check out, and the team will help me remember to put that on your Padlet. Let's look at the matrix because the next one is really just an iteration of that. Okay, so in the green, we did check in, check out, C-I-C-O. That is the borderline simplest version. The next one down is check in, check up, check out. So let me show you what that card would look like. Again, it's it's still just a piece of paper, but the piece of paper is um, a little bit modified. Let me find it for you. And I will add this one to your Padlet as well. Okay. All right, you guys see this one on your screen. All we're adding is a midday checkup right here. So for the next intensive version of check in, check out, we're adding a midday time where this where the student and that adult, so the mentor, the coach, whoever you want to call it, they get to meet in the middle of the day. That usually looks like going and checking up on the student and their lunch line. Maybe they meet for lunch on the way out of lunch. <clears throat> so it's just a little check up in the middle of the day. You can look at point totals during that time. You can decide that the morning was a total disaster. So we're just going to start our day over. And that would help to bring some closure to whatever happened in the morning, start our day over, have a better afternoon. For our itty bitties who have a hard time connecting, I did this thing in the contingent reinforcement that comes with it. Sometimes we have to shorten the time in between the good choices the student made and the contingent reinforcement they get. So sometimes they get a little reinforcement in the middle of the day. So that might be high five, sticker, something like that, a uh, little pause ticket that happens in the middle of the day because we're really trying to make that connection. We don't want them kind of wondering like, oh, I don't know, this ticket just landed in my lap and I don't know what I did to earn it, right? So for the little ones, that midday might be for reinforcement as, as well. But you're still gonna have the same point totals at the end of the day. It's really just a, a third access point for that student to see their person, their adult. For our older students, we can do peer mediated um, check in, check out. So that might be something you wanna consider. Um, and just the last note on any of these interventions is to make sure whoever their grown up or whoever their peer is, you wanna make sure that some body who gets along well with students really well, who enjoys spending time with students. Again, it doesn't take a master's degree at all. It's really simple. But where we've seen this go wrong are a few different ways. One is um, like if a principal, 
takes over a check-in, check-out group, but the principal ends up getting really busy and pulled in a million different directions and then cannot meet with a student. That can actually be really harmful because what we're trying to do is establish a relationship and we don't want the students to be disappointed when they're expecting to have time with that person and they're not available. The other reason we see this go wrong is when we put adults in the building who may be a little bit overwhelmed or grouchy, should we say, who aren't great at developing relationships with students as the check-in, check-out mentor. So you don't want this to be more time of friction or feeling lectured at or anything like that. So pick your check-in, check-out mentors or coaches, whatever you'll call them, um, really carefully. That's what I'll say on that one. All right, so if you're looking in your Padlet, we're going to move on to the Module 5 PowerPoint is where I'm going with this. And remember, the modules in between were the really in-depth modules about interventions that we don't have time for today. So I did the little overview of those different interventions. Looking at your draft matrix, we're going to start really thinking about database decision-making beyond that initial matching and intervention planning to guide intervention as we go along. So we talked already about the kind of the planning pieces are already set. Now we're moving forward into thinking through what this would look like when we're actually progress monitoring and going along. Um, we have schools who say, well, that's a lot of work. Can't we just meet like every four months about students? And I would ask you, would you do the same for academics? Would you leave a um, oral reading fluency intervention in place for four months without checking in to see how it's going? Probably not. We're probably also not going to guess how an oral reading fluency intervention is going. We're probably going to do a running record and have the student read out loud to us so we have data to go by. So we're going to do the same thing in the social emotional behavioral area. So we have our goals set for what we want to see improve for that student. Then we're going to talk about and determine how fast we want that progress to happen. Should this be kind of a quick thing or is this a student who has these um, needs kind of ingrained and it might take a little bit longer to find progress. So talking as a team for that student, how quickly you want to move, talking about different progress monitoring systems. We'll look at a few here. And then once you get going in these monthly meetings, you really have one of three decisions to make about each student you're talking about. And again, this is different than your tier one team. Your tier one team is looking at school-wide, not talking about individual cases of students, but school-wide data like hallway, cafeteria, classroom, arrival, dismissal. So in tier two meetings, we're talking about individual students, but we're really making one of three decisions. One is we're gonna stay with what we're doing because we like the progress that, that we see. Two is we're gonna fade that intervention away slowly because things are going well. Or three, we're going to intensify or move on from the intervention that we were just using. So it's really important, especially because most of these interventions come with a person who can be really powerful for students. We don't wanna just remove that person from their life all of a sudden because they did well, because that actually will feel more like a punishment than something that's happening because they're doing well now. So anytime we're talking about removing the intervention, we're gonna do it so slowly that the student can barely notice. We're gonna talk about this with the student and why we're going from daily to weekly or whatever we're doing. And we're also going to go slow because we wanna make sure that that new skill maintains. So we talk a lot about maintenance and generalization when we're talking about really developing these new skills for students at the targeted area. So the maintenance part of it is we want to make sure if we're fading off of it, so our support is fading or we're checking in less frequently or that self-monitoring form is now every five minutes instead of every one minute, that that new skill that they're able to use stays in place while we slowly fade. If the old behaviors come back, we're going to shift back to where we were with that level of support because that's really the student communicating to us they're not quite ready they still require that level of support it's okay it happens but we could start to fade and then realize we need to come back with that same level of support if it doesn't maintain the other component that we really look at 
when fading is generalization, which means let's say we're doing a social skills group, a girls group for seventh grade girls, and we're talking about friendships and we're talking about gossiping and that sort of thing, social media, let's say. Um, what we want to look at for generalization is that we're using these new skills of um, communicating effectively, um, being positive with our peers, not just in the group. It's a good thing to be able to change that behavior during group. What we're really hoping for for generalization is, are we using those new skills on the bus, um, during assembly, during PE, on the softball team, um, in the classroom? So that's generalizing that new skill beyond just that one time while you're together in group. So that is maintenance and generalization. Those two things we wanna keep in mind before we fade and remove those interventions, okay? And then the next step, if we're not responding to interventions, we're gonna go down in our accordion of that category. We're gonna stay in the same category. We're gonna to go to a more intensive intervention. And then if you've kind of used up all those interventions that are in the category, what we might have to do next is start thinking about tier three. And I will leave that up to however tier three needs to look in your schools and districts. We have some that tier three is the cutoff for referral for um, special education. We have some that try to do intensive individualization without IEPs and without special education. It's really hard because it intensive individualized interventions take a lot of resources. So just wherever that line is for you after tier three, after we have the data to support, we've implemented evidence-based interventions. We have progress monitoring data to support our decisions. We've moved to other interventions and adapted the intervention. We're still not seeing the response we need. That's your rationale for we may need more support um, at the tier three level. There's two things I wanna say here that are really important before we move on when we're talking about kind of this moving back and forth within tiers. One thing is the crisis zone. So I'm talking about going from tier one to tier two, staying at tier two for a while, trying different things at tier three, tier two, maybe ending up at tier three as a slow data-driven process. However, I want you to hear me say, if a student is in absolute crisis, things are tanking, um, the student is unsafe, the student is creating an unsafe learning environment, we won't, we won't go through all of this time at tier two. If the student's needs are already very clearly tier three needs, and the student is in crisis, you will respond with the what the student actually needs, right? So we wouldn't just let them kind of fail within tier two when they're in the middle of a crisis. So that could be um, tier three behavioral supports, intensive individualization, FBA, BIP. It could be also tier three kind of referral out for mental health services. If what we if what the student needs is beyond what we can do at tier two and the, the level of need is at a crisis level, you would go ahead and do that. The other thing I wanna say, anytime you're talking about intensifying and going down into more intensive interventions, it's really important that you all make sure that the student actually received the intervention that was designed as it was designed in a consistent way. We see a lot of times where teachers are saying, oh, it's just not working, Johnny's not responding to this new intervention, we're just gonna have to try something different. And when we go back and check, it turns out Johnny didn't get the benefit of responding to that intervention because the adults didn't put it in place to fidelity. So this is where it becomes really important not to skip pieces of the intervention, not to have this be, you know, we're doing it one day, we're not doing it the next day, not following through, rushing through things, taking out components, because really students can only respond to interventions that they receive to fidelity. Then if that's all in place and they're not responding, then we can make those decisions accordingly. Otherwise, we really do have to check ourselves and make sure before we determine a student is not responding that they actually got the, the intervention as intended. Okay, so a few little notes there. All right, so we talked about kind of that initial goal. You can set the goal for that student as a school-wide PBIS goal, like be respectful, 
um, be safe, or you can create kind of more individual goals for that student. The team will have to decide what does mastery criteria look like for that student. And when you're having this team-based discussion, what you're going to want to talk about is it's not perfection. So mastery of a skill is never perfection. None of us are perfect. Probably nobody here has been on task perfectly this whole time, right? So we wouldn't expect perfection to be able to fade off of tier two and back into tier one. What we're looking for is kind of that grade level, developmental level, appropriate um, demonstration of that skill. So if you're talking about time on task and you're talking about a kindergartner time on task, what you're hoping for is a good three to five minutes on task. That's probably developmentally appropriate and that can look like tier one, go back to tier one. If you are in sophomore in high school and you can only perform three to five minutes on task at a time that, that we haven't met our goal yet, right? So it really shifts and changes what does mastery look like um, depending on what grade level and developmental level we're at. Then we'll have to figure out that degree of improvement and pace imp of improvement that we are expecting for the student. That one look, seems kind of like nebulous until you've actually done this a few times and you can kind of sense, especially given the different interventions and the different scores, you can start to see like, oh, we may be here for a little while at tier two, which is also fine. Um, or, oh, this should be a quick little, you know, four week thing that we introduce and we should be back at tier one in no time. So you'll, you'll kind of get a feel for that progress towards the goal as you go along and do this. Sorry there, okay. Um, and then for progress monitoring, you will already have some data that you need. We'll talk about when you need to collect extra data, but the data that you're gonna have to make decisions, you're gonna need to decide our progress towards that goal, whether it's time to move back to tier one, fade, intensify, or tier three. So no matter what your decision is, you need a data point to help you uh, rationalize that decision. We're not just gonna do guessing, right? We wouldn't do that with academics, so we're not gonna do that with behavior. So we're going to need some data. And the really good news is a lot of these options that we've already talked about already have data built in with them. There are some other data points that are in your school that you can consider that I'll go over. And then the last thing is there may be some cases where we need to collect some additional data. So let's start with the data that's already kind of in your school-wide ecology and living in your school that you have access to that you could think through. So yes, you have school-wide discipline data. What we're hoping is that requires a student to go to the office, right? We're hoping that's not happening very often at all. So that's not gonna be very rich quality progress monitoring data. Progress monitoring data would be very frequent, so daily or weekly. Hopefully we're not going to the office every week, so you wouldn't have that sensitive data to really monitor progress. Um, if you are on tier two for six months, you may have one office discipline referral in there, which isn't very sensitive to give you progress monitoring data for decisions. One thing that's also on this list at the bottom is attendance data. You may have, especially if you're in a secondary setting, you may have more sensitive or frequent progress monitoring data on tardies and maybe some um, um, absences, unexcused absences as well. But you could use, if you're working on on time to class, you could use some of that attendance data there. You also have academic grades if any of your... Um, your skills are related to academics. So especially that hyperactivity and attention one, um, completing assignments and so forth. So there's some cautions. We talked about these last time and using discipline data, they tend to be subjective and not exactly accurate. So um, you don't wanna lean too heavily on the discipline data. Your next data that may already be living at your school is data from your reinforcement system. I was actually, yesterday was President's Day and I was with the kids and I had two eight-year-olds with me and they both said, mom, why do our teachers take away our dojo points? And we had a whole conversation about earning negative dojo points, uh, which is called response cost and it's a no-no. So if you're doing that, um, we try not to do that. 
try to encourage folks not to that you just wouldn't be earning the positives where we don't really take away. But they told me that one of their classmates has negative dojo points. I don't even know if that's possible with dojo, but the point is that there are data in that reinforcement system. So whether you're talking about tickets and being able to go to the school store, if you're talking about a secondary setting where your system is um, no office referrals, less than three tardies and no unexcused absences, and you get to go to the party or the whatever it is, um, you can see if that student has been making that list. If you're using an electronic system, such as Dojo, I don't know what the other names of them, but Class Dojo does this, you can actually look at their um, reinforcement system data and see how often they're earning points for different behaviors and hopefully not taking away points, but you might be able to see some um, unexpected or un unwanted behavior tracked on there too. So um, there may be some data in that system as well if you wanna try to leverage any of those um, for your any kind of informative. What's your real progress monitoring data you are gonna wanna use from the interventions that are listed here and then some will have to collect because we want this to be pretty regular data. So again, not office discipline referral data. Academic data tends to be a little bit distal to what we're trying to work on. So if we're trying to work on on task, those grades improving might come right away, but it might be a little, it may be a lag there. So let's look at these. These are some of our tier two interventions that we talked about already this morning. And these, if you're using these in your matrix, already have progress monitoring built into them. So if you have these interventions on your matrix for these students, you would not need to collect any more progress monitoring data. You just have to use the data that's already in the intervention itself. So that will be a little bit different than the one we'll talk about in a minute where we'll have to collect some data. Let me explain kind of how you would pull data from these interventions and therefore not have to collect any extra data. So for your check-in, check-out varieties, see those two variations that we saw, or if you're using check, connect, and expect, that's the one at the very bottom here in the conduct category. Anybody in the conduct category already has a data point included because you have that daily data with the daily progress report, the DPR. So you have that percentage of points earned. That's the daily progress monitoring that you need. What we're hoping is somebody can put that into an Excel spreadsheet on your team and you can graph that data over time. So we might be at 47% one day, 62 at the next day, 54 at the next day, 87 the next day. Those daily percentages become your progress monitoring data. So when it comes to looking at the student's behavior across a month during those monthly meetings, you can look at all of those data. And it really does help if you can visually represent all of this um, for the team, if you have a data guru on your team. So again, that's also when we can check to see if check-in, check-out was actually put in place the way it was designed. So if you're looking at check-in, check-out data, and you only have two data points on average per week, that means the student hasn't gotten check-in, check-out. So that's another time you can do a little bit of a fidelity check there too, because you should be seeing a daily data point with check in, check out, or any of those variations. Okay, the next category is the hyperactivity and attention category, and that already ha has data on that one too. So you do not need to collect any more progress monitoring data for that one if you are using those interventions that I told you about. So if you're using goal setting, you have that goal setting sheet. So whether that's daily or weekly goal setting, whether or not that student met their goal is your progress monitoring. So what you're hoping is over time, they are meeting their goal more often and you should have some sort of notes or data about how they met their goal. That's what you're gonna bring to your monthly meeting to talk about progress. So if a student is doing well, that means they're meeting their goal. You can see some data about whether it's staying in their seat or raising their hand, um, completing assignments and so forth. For self-monitoring, the student is literally collecting the data for you. So that's really nice if they're doing that well. Remember, you may need the teacher to also collect kind of parallel for a little while. But when you get into real self-monitoring, the student's actually collecting the data for you. Um, so those data where the student is marking every one minute or three minutes, am I on task, yes or no, those will end up being your progress monitoring data. You can convert those into percentages, percentages of yes, 
um, again, we don't want to really progress monitoring the behavior we don't want to see. We want to progress monitor the behavior we do want to see. So the student is collecting your progress monitoring data for you on that one. And with self-graphing, it's kind of similar. So the student is actually self-graphing for the team. You can actually take a picture of the graph and every week, and you can actually share that with your team. So the student is collecting the data and graphing it for you as well. So no need to collect any extra data in hyperactivity and attention or under conduct. For the um, pro-social and peer problems, so the first intervention we talked about was behavior contracts. Those you can use very similar to um, the goal setting form. If the student is meeting their contract, and you saw in the example that we looked at, there was actually kind of data on how they did or did not meet their contract. Those are your progress monitoring data. You don't need to collect any extra data. The contract itself is the data, as long as you're not losing it. Um, I guess I should have said that with all of these. So don't let your check-in, check-out forms go into the trash or go home and not come back. So all of this is, is counting on the fact that we are actually keeping all of these permanent products from the interventions so that we can use those for progress monitoring. So whether that means you're taking pictures of them with your phone, storing them, or you're actually taking the pieces of paper, putting them in a folder and looking at those, or somebody is kind of trans posing those data onto an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. So um, under pro-social and peer problems, if you are using the behavior contracts, that behavior contract can be your progress monitoring tool. That means everything else, we're gonna have to collect some extra data. So restorative practices or problem solving activities, there's really not any progress monitoring data within that. Social skills curriculum, typically doesn't have any progress monitoring unless we're asking teachers to kind of fill out a little checklist with weekly. I'll show you an example of that. Same thing with emotional symptoms. Under that category, what's really interesting is because they're so internalized, the behaviors are so internalized that the students are working on. A lot of times in that category, we're asking the student to self-reflect about their feelings, about their emotions, about their um, coping about their different symptoms or whatever. So we're actually asking the student to tell us how their internal state is and whether or not that's improving. Because that one's a really hard to hard one to see on the outside. You can have a student kind of struggling internally and you would need to hear from the student how things are going. So that would be more like a check-in with the student, a form where they self-evaluate. So let's look at a few of those. Um, there's a strategy called direct behavior ratings, and this is an example of it. I've given you the website here too, if you wanna look up, there's plenty of free examples here. For any of the categories that didn't have a progress monitoring data point already built into it, you could set up a direct behavior rating system for that student. Um, so you can see here there's one for kind of younger children and then one for older children. This is asking the teacher to fill this out on the student. And again, if we're talking about the emotional symptom category, we're gonna ask the student to tell us how they're feeling, but this would really be for um, pro-social and peer problems under the problem solving activities and social skills. You can have the teachers let you know how the student is doing with that behavior on a weekly basis, um, on a daily basis would be a lot, but in general, you're getting some, some data as a piece of feedback about how things are going in the classroom. Okay, the last one is behavioral observation. These are the data that we use when we're doing a research study. However, it's not exactly feasible to collect these data um, while you're teaching too. So this would be kind of our gold standard of how we monitor and observe and record data behavioral data especially. So you've got the frequency, kind of tallies, duration, interval, and latency. The reason why we don't really spend a lot of time on this though is because it usually requires a second individual. So if the teacher is teaching, then it's also hard to write down every time the student talks out or how long a student might be having a tantrum. So these are good data. They're great data for research studies. If you have a teacher's assistant, paraprofessional, or a student teacher, these would be great data to have someone else collect, but it kind of is that kind of fly on the wall 
recording person, which would require extra person. So it's not exactly feasible, even though we kind of mention it, if it's possible. All right, so that would be your frequency. You define the behavior and tally each time the behavior occurs. The next thing you're gonna have to think through, and this is gonna be something that you can plan for when you have your planning time today, is how are you going to get those data? So whether they are check-in, check-out, daily progress report cards or goal setting, I met my goal, yes or no, or what we just looked at there, direct behavior ratings. How are you gonna get those data to the tier two team? So when your tier two team meets, you've gotta have the data to look at. So you need to set up some systems for tracking that data over time, storing that data. You can look month to month to see how things are going. Like I said, it is a really, really good idea to graph those data. Um, looking at individual data points, you can the trend can kind of get lost and the goal can kind of get lost. So if you graph those, if you're entering anything in Excel, you have you just a few clicks away from a graph. So if you have the opportunity to set up a system like that, it'd be great. And then whatever your system is for collecting the data, then getting those data to the tier two team, then how the tier two team is going to process them is the next step. So how is the team going to make decisions based on that progress? And then after the team makes those decisions, they have to communicate out with the family, sometimes with the student themselves and with other staff on the new decision that they made. So they're deciding to fade the intervention to once a week or intensify the intervention to twice a week social skills lessons or whatever your decision is, you have to be able to communicate that out so everybody involved knows. So you have a lot of planning pieces here on this slide that you'll have to go back to when you get your system set up. How are you going to enter, store, track those data? Can you graph them? Is there a simple way to graph the data? And it might be, you might end up with DPR graphs from check in, check out, and then a separate kind of a graph that looks at goal setting. So you might have different looking graphs, but is there a way to graph it? And then how will the team make decisions based on those data? And then how will the team communicate those decisions out? So those are all things that, I don't dictate to you, but you get to figure out what works best for your school. <clears throat> okay, so when you're looking at the data, we've talked about a few of these options here that the team gets to decide. So for planning for response, so things are going well. A lot of times if things are going well, we're just gonna hold. It's like if you're playing, I don't know what card game that is in Las Vegas where like, Oh, is it 21? Whatever the card game is where you're like, I want to hold. I don't want to do anything different. So sometimes you just hold where you are. Then if things are not going well, sometimes that means you need to adapt the intervention because maybe the student isn't participating at all. Maybe you have to adapt it because it hasn't been put in place because we need to reschedule. We need to look at a different mentor or maybe we need to look at actually intensifying that intervention or changing to a different intervention. So if things are going really well and have been over time with what you see here, maintenance and generalization, we can slowly fade the intervention. Again, you're not gonna just rip off the Band-Aid on removing the intervention. It is a great thing to have response for the, your intervention, but what the last thing you wanna do is cause more harm, introduce more kind of fractured relationships. So the student and whoever they work with would say, this is going great, I'm so proud of you. You can come see me anytime, but I just want you to know that our goal setting, instead of doing this every day, I'm going to see you on Monday, and then I'll see you again on Monday, on Friday. So fading very, very slowly and in communication with the student. Then your other decisions, if things are not going well, you can intensify still within tier two, so still within that same category, or you can make the decision that we've kind of exhausted all of our tier two resources and now it's time to do whatever your procedures say for you to do once you get past tier two. So whether that's special education referral, um, psychological testing, or just moving to a tier three intensive individualized. Okay. So there's your modify. First, always consider treatment integrity, also known as fidelity. 
Check in with your tier one fidelity as well. So it might be that we've stopped talking about school-wide expectations. It might be that we haven't had a celebration or the school store has been closed. Um, check in on your identification and your progress monitoring process. Make sure those data that you're relying on are actually accurate. And then also check in on your tier two intervention. Make sure that before you say a student isn't responding, that they actually got that intervention. All right, so when we're looking at intensifying within that conduct category, we're really talking about going from check in, check out to check in, check up, check out. You could actually adapt these a few different ways. You could introduce a peer mentor. You could increase access to reinforcement as well. For those behavior contracts, we can go intensify back to daily instead of weekly. For your goal setting, the same thing. You could go from a weekly goal to a daily goal, increased access to reinforcement. For self-monitoring, one good way to intensify self-monitoring is um, to shorten the, the intervals that the student is recording. So if you start out at every five minutes or 10 minutes or three minutes, you can shorten those down and prompt the student more frequently will really help in intensifying. And then for self-graphing, we could go from a weekly look at the graph to looking at it actually day, day to day. Okay, so for your pro-social peer problem category, remember we collapse those two, go from a weekly contract to daily, increased access to reinforcement, choice of reinforcement, make sure the student has some voice in that. Um, and then if you want to, there is an option on behavior contracts to also add a contract clause for misbehavior or unwanted behavior and list out the consequences there. Um, just because a student is on tier two doesn't take away consequence systems that are set up in the office discipline referral. So if, if that also has to occur, you can list that clause as well. For those problem solving activities, you could add more time processing, discussing those events, more time in those restorative chats. Um, social skills, you can increase the number of sessions. So it, we're, instead of planning on doing six sessions, you might plan on doing 12. The length of each session, so from 20 minutes to 40 minutes, or move from a small group um, implementation to one-on-one. -on -one. We also see some counselors who are able to do uh, a small group session for everybody. And then the teacher comes back once a week, one-on-one -on -one, and reviews that lesson as well. So there's a lot of ways to kind of intensify um, with those social skills lessons. If you're using cognitive behavioral treatments for the counselor, we can do the same thing. So we can increase what we call dosage going from small group to one-on-one. -on -one. And then also anything for the counselor to be able to provide as far as wraparound services, that might be helpful as well. Same thing for fading. So we're going out the other way. So twice a month instead of once a week, um, check in, check out goes to every other day. You check in on Monday morning and do a midday checkout. So there's lots of ways you can kind of fade that slowly over time. With goal setting, the same thing. You can do a twice a month assessment. You can also have students start to do self-evaluation and self-reinforcement. Um, that really works well in this category when we're shifting to self-regulation. Um, for self-monitoring, we can take away that teacher evaluation piece, shorten or, or elongate those monitoring times. So instead of um, the intervals will get longer, but the actual time of monitoring might go from a um, 60 minute period to now we're just gonna self-monitor for 15 minutes out of that period. And then moving definitely to all that self-evaluation, self-reinforcement um, piece as well. For pro-social peer problems, we're pretty much gonna do the opposite of what we just talked about with intensifying, which is really fading that, moving to a peer leader instead of a um, adult leader. That would be really good. For those problem-solving activities, you could shift to all self-evaluation where the student is self-reflecting on what happened and kind of being self-driven or independent about those repairs and the restorative pieces, leading their own restorative chats and those sorts of things. For social skills, fading the lessons, increasing the focus on naturalistic environments. So again, we wanna practice in our small group, but what we're really hoping for is over time, those new skills are um, available you know, throughout our day, wherever we go, right? 
Okay. All right. Then for the emotional symptom, we're talking about our counselors again here, doing our um, fading from individual to small group, also fading off any of that wraparound support that may be there too. All right, so there's always some questions about using the SDQ as a pre-post measure and kind of using it more than just that initial identification time point. So I thought I would just go ahead and mention it here. The SDQ is definitely a pre. So it is designed as a screener, which means it's not really sensitive enough to give more than one time of year and really rely on those data. It wouldn't be like a three times a year benchmarking thing. And in case you didn't already think this through, nobody wants to fill that out three times a year anyway. So getting buy-in to fill that out three times a year would be a lot anyway. What we do see sometimes is the team thinks the student is ready to fade back to tier one. And the before we do that, the team wants to check or the teacher wants to check or the caregiver wants to check that we're really ready. So we may do kind of an informal post SDQ at that time point. It's not required by any means. Um, so I would take that data just as an extra data point in making that decision to fade back to tier one. Some people also want to, at the end of each year, get um, a fresh SDQ score on anybody in tier two. That is the most you could really do at the SDQ is twice a year. It's really only designed for once a year. Again, not as a progress monitoring tool, and it's kind of extra work. But if you wanted to end the year with a, a report to families about how things are going, and you want to get that data point and be able to compare data from the beginning of the year to now, you could with a little asterisk that it's, it's not going to be super accurate because the SDQ is not intended to measure tiny bits of change. It's really kind of um, this broader screener. So if you wanted to add that, you could. It is extra work. So it's one of those things that's kind of like, if you want to um, add that, you're right. So back to our teams, our problem solving teams. Remember we talked about last time and um, just so the um, patent team knows there was somebody asking for the link to the recording from last time. Um, so the team members representative across your school include an administrator for administrator kind of decision-making authority. If you have social worker, counselor, behavior specialist, somebody who knows behavior really well, social emotional needs really well, include them on the team as a great resource for you. Um, we talked about this last time. This could be the same team as a tier one team on a very, very small school, but the team, it would shift focus. Uh, you would do your tier one business, looking at school-wide data, uh, times of day, locations in the building, and then you would shift to focusing on tier two, which is really discussing individual students and cases of students on tier two. So that would really only be for a small school. Some of you teach in schools that have like two second grade teachers, and so maybe 10 teachers total, then you're small enough to just have one team, but you would be shifting the focus um, on the different kind of assignments that, that those two teams would do. Can the team be the same as the RTI academic team? Yes, and please do that if you already have a system or a structure in place for meeting about academics. What we're hoping this can do is link on to those discussions. That team is already meeting once a month. That team is already looking at data. So link all of this on to that rather than having two siloed teams. Um, it's not efficient, but also it's not effective because the students that you're meeting about with academics, you're likely going to also be talking about some of those students in tier two for social, emotional, behavioral needs. Can, okay, this team should collaborate and talk to the tier one team, right? So about what they're seeing and how things are going, those two teams can collaborate and communicate. And then generally for buy-in across the school, it's really good to present how things are going with tier two to your general faculty. Not everybody will have a student that's on tier two. Not everybody will be implementing a tier two intervention or helping with those. So it's really good to for your faculty to know, you know, this month we started out with 64 students on tier two. We've already faded 14 of those back to tier one. 
we only moved one over to tier three. Everybody else is hanging out at tier two. Maybe each faculty member meeting, you could kind of review a different tier two strategy so everybody can remember how they are implemented, something like that. So there's really good linking with your general faculty as well from your tier two team. All right, so remember for your families, you're gonna communicate when there is a tier two referral. Um, some districts and states are now requiring before you do the SDQ to notify caregivers that you're gonna be screening. Most still will allow after the SDQ has been done before intervention though. And then during tier two intervention, you wanna report that progress back to the family, especially if there's changes in intervention and if things are going well, we wanna celebrate that and share that out as well. And then definitely um, communicating with the family when moving back to tier one or moving on to tier three. Your administrator should be on your teams, but let's just say your tier two team has the assistant principal, but not the principal. So we're gonna have to bring all of our administrators up to date on what's going on with tier two. Um, some schools have grade level principals. So make sure that all administration is caught up monthly or so on what's going on with tier two. All right, now we're going to look at some forms. I'm just going to show you some different forms that are in your Padlet. Um, and if if I say they're in your Padlet and you tell me they're not, we will get those in there too. So if you will give me a minute, we're going to look at the individual plan of action. We're going to look at some meeting agendas and some kind of tracking forms, your your um, your. The, your general plan for tier two, and then there's a mid-year assessment, I think that we have in there too. So let's start looking at all the different forms that will support your implementation. Let me find. Okay, I think some of these were in your folder last time. So let me look really quick. Sorry, give me one minute. Okay, let's start with this one. All right, the first section on your tier two blueprint is about your team. Who is on your team? Remember, we need an administrator, grade level knowledge, someone with behavioral expertise, and you could fill out anybody else that's there as well. You need to assign team roles. Who is the tier two lead? Who is the tier two note taker, timekeeper, and who is your data expert? Then your team will need to decide when your monthly meetings are going to be. How are you going to report back to the teachers? We just talked about that. And how are you going to report back to caregivers and parents? On the next page, you are going to decide which screener you're going to use, whether that's the SDQ, the SABERS, the SRSSIE. How will you implement the screener? Remember, the gold standard is universal teacher completed. Some schools want to try to use the screener as a um, targeted data point. So anybody you're concerned about, you would complete this on. It's not advisable to use it that way. Um, but again, you get to decide. All right, where were we? We were on the screener. Okay, so um, your planning meeting, your secondary data, your referral throughout the year. The next section is all about what interventions you will have available at your school. So if you drafted out your matrix earlier this morning already, and you added in something that your school already has, put that down in other. But these are um, organized by category. So your conduct category, you can just put a check mark here. If yes, you have check-in, check-out. Yes, you have check-in, check-up, check-out. Um, and then, you have a little bit of a note section for matching and aligning with tier one here. We want all of our tier two interventions to match and align as much as possible. Then you have your hyperactivity section here, add in your interventions. You'll wanna go in order of intensity just to keep yourself organized. And then your peer problems pro-social goes here. And then your emotional symptoms, that's for your counselor probably to fill out this section here. 
on what they have available. And then you have kind of a list of your interventions. You can go then put that into your matrix if you want. The next thing that you'll need to plan is section number four, which is how are you going to get this whole system trained to all of your teachers and all those different interventions as well. So this is where we see probably the biggest hiccup, which is whoever comes to training and hears all this, it makes sense. They can come up with a plan, whether it's a team or a couple of in individuals, but you will then need to take this information and give all of your teachers information on how to screen, all of the information on what the tier two team does, what they'll be asking of everyone. And then usually what we're seeing is um, the team is training interventionists as they need. So either um, let's say one PE coach is really good at relationships. They're just going to have check-in, check-out. So before you assign them students with check-in, check-out, you train them on what that looks like and what they have to do. Probably not all of your teachers need to know all of the interventions, um, but if that makes the most sense for your school to do an overview of all the different interventions, you can do that too. And then you will have all of your teachers, you see all here, um, need to be involved with the progress monitoring piece because that is going to be data usually from the classroom or maybe the intervention itself, but the, the classroom teacher needs to help us get that progress monitoring data to the team. And so you can plan out how that will look and when that will happen, what they will need to do and what they'll need to know. Okay. Then your team is going to be in charge of tracking proportions. So each month, how are you going to track the number of students who are on tier two, the number of students who are staying at tier two, the number of students who have moved on to tier three, the number of students have moved back for tier one, all of those proportions have to be tracked. Uh, monthly is a great idea, but at least quarterly as well. The next is how will you plan to monitor fidelity of the intervention? So it's somebody gonna observe every once in a while on those goal setting sessions, the, take a look at the permanent products of um, the self-monitoring form. So how will you make sure those interventions are actually taking place? And then annually, you're going to need to monitor your entire system tier two um, fidelity. And that is on the tiered fidelity inventory that we talked about the first time. You can also Google that and find it. But what will you, who's gonna complete that? What month, it's usually May. And then what are you going to do with those data? That's your when you're creating your action plan to improve your tier two system for the next year. Okay. Section number five is all about how the tier two team will make those database decisions that we just talked about. So whether that's from the check-in, check-out form, where are you going to get these data, whether you have to add some data, that's the direct behavior rating, and then all of your questions about how this is actually going to look. Who's going to collect those data? Who's going to bring them to the meeting? Who's going to graph them or store them? And then how will that information be shared out? Um, definitely to the caregivers and families, to the grade level teams, and even with the student. So this is um, the start of your what tier two system, what your plan will look like, and we'll give you some time today to work on that. Um, once we get it in the Padlet, again, I apologize for that not being there, but that is, this could be updated every month. You could create a draft today with as much time as you have, take this back to your team, and get some feedback, make some changes to it. But that's how you start to put all of this together into an actual tier two plan. Okay, so that was our first document. Let me find our next document. I see some questions in the Q&A, but I'm getting kind of distracted and it's hard but for me. I to... have them. Um, I have okay. them covered. Okay. And that, that um, document, the blueprint was added to both Padlets, Padlet 1 and Padlet 2 for ease of use. Perfect. It's under teaming slash meetings on today's Padlet, the tier two blueprint. Perfect. So the next one that we're going to look at is the IPA, the individual plan of action. And I think we just, I think you guys did find that one. I'm, I am now trying to find it for myself. 
Let's see. And everybody pull up the individual plan of action. So the one we just looked at, the blueprint, is for your entire school, your whole system. The next one that we're going to look at, you would complete for each student. So after they've been referred to tier two, your each student needs a plan. And this is the checklist that we go through for each student. So let me find that. Sorry, that took me a minute. I put it somewhere I couldn't find it. Okay. So again, the difference between the two is the one we just looked at is for your whole school, whole system. And this one you would have for each student on tier two. So you can name this whatever you want. This one's called the individual plan of action. So you have student name, grade, team members, initial referral date. The next section is about that referral. How did the student get referred? Was it from the universal screening? Maybe the teacher referred, the caregiver referred, or the student referred themselves. And then on that SDQ, and again, you can adapt this if you're using the SABERS or the SRSS. So your overall score, and then you would kind of circle or underline which category it fell into, whether it was the borderline or elevated category, whichever terms, again, you want to use there. So first is your overall score that got the student into tier two. And then you list the score for each of the five categories down below. And you circle what, what kind of that corresponded to normal borderline or, ele or um, elevated. Then you list a whole section here about that student. So what are their strengths? What are their preferences? What are their interests? This section will really help you to build on the strengths and to leverage those preferences and interests in adapting interventions in a way that the student will buy in. So that's why that's really important. Then for that student, based on the data that's above, you have to match the intervention to the first, the domain or the category. So for that student, what is the primary focus you're going to have? So maybe it's conduct or emotional symptoms or hyperactivity. And then what is the least intensive strategy you can offer and what is a more intensive strategy you can offer? Go back to your matrix for that. What's the initial one the team is deciding to go with? Any adaptations the team sees as necessary to that intervention. And then the second section here is if a secondary domain, if a second domain, so maybe conduct and hyperactivity, if a second domain, domain is needed, you could list that one there too. Okay, then for the team, the initial decision rules that we just talked about. So what is the actual goal statement for that student? What does mastery criteria look like? So that's on task behavior, conflict resolution, um, using kind words, whatever it is. For the intervention you decided, who is implementing that intervention? What progress monitoring tool you will use? So what, what data will you use? Will you graph those data? How will you get those data to the team meeting every month? Then what is that kind of um, rate and amount of time you're expecting for this student to show you progress? So we talked about kind of each student may progress at different paces, but what is the pace that makes that you're thinking makes the most sense for this student? Then your questions are about response and non-response. So what intervention will you use if the student is progressing? What intervention will you use if the student is not progressing? How will you plan to fade back to tier one? What are the criteria for moving on to tier three? And then how are you gonna communicate back out to family and to other teachers and the student? So at the end of this section, you have the date of the initial plan, when it was initiated and when the family was notified. So dates go here. 
So that's all setting up the initial plan for that individual student. And you can simplify the way that makes sense for you guys. The next section are a series of four progress updates. So I'll show you what one looks like and then I'll kind of scroll through to show you what all four would look like. So each month you would come back to each individual student's IPA and you would have their progress monitoring data here and their IPA here. And you say, okay, team, here's the data. We're gonna project it onto the screen. We can see a graph. For the progress monitoring data summary, is the student responding as expected? Has the student received the intervention as planned? Or has the intervention not been put in place as planned? And is the student not responding as expected? So you check a box there. And then based on those data, based on what's going on, do we need to stay with the intervention or modify the intervention? So do we need to fade, intensify, or adapt? Obviously, if this answer is no, the intervention has not been put in place with, as planned, then the decision is we need to put the intervention in place. So let's figure out why it's not in place. And that is any other notes might go here. That's all you have every month to fill out on each student at tier two. So you check, 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 circle which one of these you're gonna do and any notes go down below. So on this one document that you guys have, that's one progress update. So that might be November. Progress update two is the exact same decisions. So that could be December. Progress update three, maybe January. And then progress update four, maybe February. So you may need six of these. You may need eight. You may need two. I just listed four there for you. So you could kind of see that that quick decision making is what you need to talk through every month. Okay, so that one is for each individual student. The blueprint is for your whole school system. The IPA is for individual students. All right. Now I've got a million tabs open, so let me see. All right. All right, you have an example of an initial team meeting agenda, just to kind of glance at. So your very first meeting might look like something like this. You um, can adapt this and you can use what parts of it you like, but I wanted to kind of draw a contrast between your initial, dis initial meetings and then kind of further in the year on these once you get on the pace of monitoring progress. So this might be your initial meeting where you're establishing roles and responsibilities, do we have the right team here? Do we need to look at our tiered fidelity inventory? Then looking at pieces of your tier two system, making sure you have everything in place before you get going. You could have this meeting even in August and September before you do screening. And then do you have any homework items that we need to do before next time and evaluate your meeting? So this, this would look like a very first tier two meeting. And then let me show you what the ongoing meetings would look like and how that's kind of different. So if you look in your Padlet, there's one for March. I'm just gonna show you what March. And this is, I think, still from, this is an example from COVID days, hold on. Let's see. All right. So getting into the year, we're on our regular pace of tier two meetings. So who's in attendance? Are there any fidelity issues that we need to talk about? Yes or no, hopefully not. Um, anything just in general about your system? So do we need to make any changes to our referral process? Um, our tracking and referral forms, our fidelity, do we need to check on fidelity of implementation in a single, um, for a person implementing or for a single type of intervention? So. This is kind of a procedural meeting where you're going over your system and checking in on your system as you go. And then you would also include going through those student cases and all that progress monitoring data. So this is kind of all housekeeping stuff. And then you would go through each of your students on tier two and make those decisions. So that's kind of a March, kind of a regular kind of a meeting peek at that. Let me show you what we use as a mid-year, and actually we just converted this to a Google form, but um, I'll show you this on what you have on your Padlet. So in the middle of the year, because we're evaluating 
Fidelity annually in May. What we don't want to do is go through the whole year and not kind of do a check on ourselves and see how tier two is going. So in the middle of the year, we do this mid-year assessment. It's really informal, but it helps guide the team to make sure you are you have all the pieces in place and that you're doing um, tier two as designed. So listing the interventions that you guys have that are in place. Has your team been meeting at least once a month? <clears throat> And then your proportions here. So how many students have been referred to tier two? How many have moved back to tier one? How many have moved on to tier three? <clears throat> and then have your interventions been put in place with fidelity? Maybe you're struggling in that area. Maybe goal setting is going really well. Self-monitoring is going really well, but we can't seem to get check-in, check-out going or our counselor is too busy to do small groups. So problem solving for that. And then in general, looking back at your framework and what you planned, has this been beneficial so far? If not, you need to make some changes to how it's going, um, maybe procedural changes. Maybe the team decided to meet. We have this quite often where you guys tell me, we want to meet twice a month. And I say, okay, give that a try. And then it turns out in like March, everybody's drowning in meetings and that's way too much. So is if there's anything you need to do in the middle of the year to benefit your school and your students, you can make this kind of mid-year shift. So that's in your Padlet, you have this kind of mid-year tier two assessment. And honestly, it's really good to look at all of your practices in the middle of the year and see how they're going um, and see if they're benefiting students. All right, the last thing I will show you is if you wanna click on the tier two procedural fidelity checklist, if anybody's really into collecting data and really wants to know if you're doing tier two right throughout the year for each student, this is bonus points kind of data, but if you wanted to check fidelity for each student receiving tier two, this is a procedural checklist that we came up with um, for you. So again, you don't have to do this. This is very specific to each student, making sure you're doing all the pieces and steps for each student. Um, but if you wanted to check and just fill this out for a random sample of like 10 students, just to make sure each student is getting what they need. The tiered fidelity inventory is kind of your whole school system, and it doesn't ever look at are, are each student, is each student getting what they need? So if you wanted that level of data, you would use this form here. If this looks like too much, just pretend like you never saw it and pretend like I never said anything. So the first is kind of about the referral to tier two for this student. So you would, you know, put in there, uh, Whitney Prime is the student's name and all of these answers you would be answering for that one student. I'm talking about the universal screener, talking about, uh, oh, it looks like, here, let me see if I can, there we go. Um, the domains and the matching for the interventions here, the decision rules made for that student specifically, how progress monitoring is going for that student, then the database decision-making based on those progress monitoring data, and then communication with all the different stakeholders. So that's your, your education staff, the family, and the student. So this one would be a total out of 50. Each item is zero, one, and two. And again, if you wanted to make sure that each student was getting all the different pieces, you'll probably see when you do this that there are some pieces missing. And you can see across, if you did many of these, you would see like a lot of them are missing this one piece. Um, and you could actually do some action planning around that too. So this would be extra data, but for anybody that was interested. And that should walk you through the entire Padlet. I'm gonna make sure I got everything there. Mid-year, yes. Okay, so let me get to the Q&A really quick. And then we're gonna take a break. And then during the break, I'm gonna put um, some different things that you could use your time for and uh, Q and A time. Um, so when you come back, you'll see some assignments, and you can pick which ones you want to do. And then that'll be work time and, and question and answer time until we go today. But let me get to this question really quick. Scenario question: At the mid-year meeting, it was brought up that grade level teams have brought up multiple students whom teachers are concerned about. 
when looking at the SDQs, the reports didn't show any concerns. Would you recommend the teams redo the SDQ um, or move to another avenue? Um, okay, so in this scenario, it sounds like probably the September SDQ is no longer accurate, which is totally fine to redo the SDQ at that time. The other thing that could have happened in September for the person writing this in is it could have been, um, okay, this is a warning. Don't have your homeroom teachers complete the SDQ, especially if they don't see the students for very long or for an academic period. So it could be that somebody completed the SDQ in September who doesn't see the same behaviors. So maybe the student struggles in math and that avoidant behavior only occurs in math. And so we would need the math teacher to fill this out. Um, it could also be that the student has changed throughout the school year. Something could be going on with them. Something in their home life could have changed. So then you would just redo the SDQ. So that's what I would do. And sometimes people ask me, well, what if we know there's a problem and it doesn't show up on the SDQ? It has almost never happened. So if the teacher is um, filling that out, taking their time and filling that out as accurately as possible, the SDQ usually finds the issue. Um, and actually people kind of are shocked that it's like, it's like magic, but that's what it's actually designed to do. So it usually does its job. So if you need to repeat the SDQ or have somebody else complete it, or even um, for that friend who just wrote in that question, you could actually ask the student to complete it on themselves as well. Great scenario though, I love that. Okay, let's take, it's 1044. Let's take a five minute break. And during your five minute break, get up, move around because you have some independent work to do at this point. Um, I'm gonna put your assignments up and different options that you could work through um, for the rest of your time. So that means you will be working, trying to come up with some plans, looking for anything that you might need in addition to what we've given you. So this is your time to find those things or maybe you couldn't find something and we can help you with the Padlet too. Let me show you the different assignments that you can choose from with the time that you have. So you should have all of the documents you need now for these different assignments and I will let you kind of choose your own adventure here. So you could choose to use this time to work on that whole school blueprint. Remember that is your entire tier two draft plan. You could work on this time if you have team members available, check the team composition, make sure everybody is there that needs to be on your team is listed. Um, talk about agendas and roles and timekeeping and um, note keeping and scheduling those meetings. You could use this time to review the tier two tier um, fidelity inventory that we talked about last time. That is how we will measure fidelity at the end of the year on your entire tier two system. Or you could use this time to go back to intervention specifically. So you can go um, edit some of those forms I gave you or go Google a new form of a goal setting sheet or something like that. You could also go back to your matrix and work on your matrix. So um, I wanted to make sure you had time to do some things and that you actually leave these two days that we've had together with something and a little bit of momentum for um, following you forward, but also open it up for time for plenty of questions. So the way I came up with to do that was to kind of give you a menu of things that you can work on independently. And during that time, um, we will be here for any of your questions that you have as well. So make sure you have everything in the Padlet that you needed. When you're going there, you'll download those different documents onto maybe a folder that you create for yourself. Um, and Shonda, am I right that the Padlet doesn't go away? No, the Padlet does not go away. Okay. So it's not like an emergency that you have to go download everything right now. You could also use this time to go back and listen to part of what we talked about last time, explore different screeners. So anything else that's not on this list, you can do as well. But I thought I would guide you with a few things you could get going on.